Oh, I welcome you to my another video. Uh, this video continues the series of tests that are done in the name of my test of 196 AA batteries. The biggest test anyone has ever done, at least on this planet. The test of 196 AA batteries is of course available on this channel in English or on my primary channel in Czech. Uh, the test data are available for download and can be used for non-commercial use, uh, that means for personal use. The original test of the 196 AA batteries took me a year to measure all the values, all the capacities, all the internal resistances. But my work doesn't end there. There was test of self-discharge where I left a rechargeable to sit half a year and then measure the remaining capacity and this test may be made public with the test of life or cycle life uh, that I have been cycling rechargeable batteries from 0 to 100% back to 0 back to 100% and so and every 100 these cycles I measured their capacity loss uh, some of them like uh, for example a Duracell rechargeable or Yisk iMail have given up after 200 to 300 cycles this cycling test will tell us the actual quality of these rechargeables so you will know that if you let's say pay 50% more uh, price for an anel loop uh, you can get three times the lifetime compared to some other batteries and that is something that matters unfortunately this takes too much time and I use my Sky RC MC 3000 just for nickel zinc and all the nickel metal hydrides are being cycled in Litokala Li-500 I have bought 12 of them uh, just for this test in future I also want to test different battery chemistries for their performance in low temperatures like minus 20 degrees centigrade or so and I was also in approximately 10% of my test of high current capabilities for NIMA batteries but that requires not only four wire method but also offset since I am unable to open MOSFET enough to drain 15 amps at 1 volt drain to source voltage uh, so I'm, I'm, and I must be performing voltage data logging all the time to determine the internal resistance so this test is postponed and may be discarded uh, so I would have more time for other more important tests just like my test of DC converters, just like the continue of my test of uh, cutting discs for angle grinder and such things. Anyway, let's get back to the topic. Can you recharge non-rechargeable alkalines? Most of them, yes. Can you do it safely? That depends. Is it profitable? That depends. I will provide this table in the video description uh, where you can download it. A red test is small leak and a red cell is catastrophic leak that may heavily damage your instrument. Please keep in mind that you do everything at your own risk. This test is just informative, so you know about the possibilities, but you are still responsible for your own actions and the outcomes. In history, there were RAM alkaline batteries. Uh, these were alkalines designed to withstand charging, as alkalines principle actually allows for limited recharging capacity, although they are not as suitable for recharging as nickel metal hydrides or nickel cadmiums or nickel zinc or old nickel iron. Uh, the RAM alkalines were more expensive and required different charger, something like old trickle chargers for nickel cells if you remember them. Uh, people didn't want to pay the extra money for like 10 times the battery life and went more consumable way to buy fresh batteries every now and then, which of course costs extra money and produces more waste. Today in 2022 slash 2023, just in few days, uh, RAM alkalines are just a history and uh, there are almost no chargers available for this technology. Fortunately, charging them is very easy and charger can be made for dirt cheap from jelly bean components. All you need is end voltage of approximately 1.65 volts with current limit up to let's say 20 milliamps. This can be achieved with a primitive resistor but we would have to keep monitoring it. So resistor with LM317 stabilizer is more convenient as it would limit the end voltage. 
However, using a resistor for current limit also brings slower charging speed at the end, so I went the way with first CC and then CV regulators, both from LM317. I also wanted to use my XL4015 converters, but their analog CC slash CV regulation is nowhere near precise, just like any analog CC CV power supplies. They may overshoot so the battery bubbles its electrolyte out at 1.8 volts, or they can never actually reach the CV limit, so the batteries would not be fully charged at all. The solution would be digitally controlled power supply, but since the current is so small here, and since I needed to charge at least six of them at a time, actually these are eight, uh, I went with this most primitive solution. Uh, this solution of course is nowhere near efficient, as at least two thirds of the power must be wasted from the design. Powering this from 12 volt would result in efficiency around 15%. So I used this DC converter to enhance the efficiency to approximately 30%. One would say that the power loss is like 2 watts, so why bother anyway? But I had this running for one year, which makes 9 kilowatt hours. The 40 cent DC converter definitely makes a difference on 9 kilowatt hours, <laughs> at least with today's prices, because I don't own a power plant. Uh, this charger has been charging for whole year, and not only alkalines for the test, but also my other alkalines. So that's why so many of them leaked here, as you can see. I can turn on the torch on my phone. It's all ugly and nasty. You can build such a charger by yourself very easily, uh, just by generic four-door charger. One of the uh, these uh, like awesome, ultimate, smart, fast charger types. Then you can just desolder the one undersized resistor that's in there and use the charger as a battery holder. After then, it's just jelly bean components. Everyone has stacks off in his drawers and organizers and boom, you are done. If you want it USB powered because this is 12 volt power, uh, you then need a step up converter to approximately six to seven volts or you must give up the CC part and put ordinary resistor there instead, as LM317 in CC mode has voltage loss of minimally 2.5 volts, so it wouldn't work with USB, but it would work if you stepped up the voltage to approximately 6 to 7 volts, or you would have to get rid of it and just place ordinary resistor there, and the CV would be then done with LM317 as it's here. Now, which batteries can be recharged? And for what gain? The absolute best was Westinghouse Dynamo Alkaline. <sighs> ah. I may place a picture in the video, it would be better than me <laughs> going through uh, these eh, like 12 kilos of batteries. So it has 2.2 uh, amp hours and we can gain up to 7 times more capacity for us just by recharging it. That means a single Westinghouse alkaline battery is worth eight the same batteries, by once or by eight times. A Duracell Procell, Panasonic Pro Power and PQC Ultra are also great because the gain is six times the capacity. Again, perfectly economic. One battery equals seven the same batteries, so you can spend seven times less. We see alkaline with 4.7 times the capacity, and then all the alkaline conrads I have seen. Yo, uh, all the alkaline conrads, conrad, uh, conrad, conrad, uh, they go around five times more. Then there is Cop Premium. There is, I believe, only Czech Republic specific. Uh, but then there is DM Paradise. So Germans can buy them and gain plus four times their capacity back. Duracell also has simply edge optimum and they gain also four times more. Unfortunately, Duracell Turbo Max can't be recharged. I have seen it somewhere around here. Duracell Duraloc Turbo Max, yeah. Uh, so Duracell Turbo Max cannot be recharged as it will heavily leak. Is the Duracell with the indicator. All the Kodaks go around four times and they can be effectively recharged. Then a media range, Philips Alkaline, Philips Ultra Alkaline, a new series of Tesco Power High Tech, Raver, and at last Verbatim. 
These all mentioned batteries can be recharged many times with so significant gain that it would make sense to charge them. Now, how about the finance? Let's say one battery costs one dollar. Let's say the DIY charger would cost me uh, four dollars for one of the ultra smart, high quality, fast charger, and maximum of two dollars for the jelly bean components. That means the charger would cost approximately six dollars. Or if one battery is one dollar, then it's like six batteries. Uh, if we add energy consumption and amortization, then if we completely use any of two mentioned batteries, like these Conrads I have just grabbed, uh, then the charger is already paid for and beginning to earn money. Well, of course, you don't have exactly two alkaline batteries. You will have significantly more batteries. So if you have four batteries, if you have eight batteries, if you keep recharging them, you can be absolutely sure that you are definitely saving money. And our planet, which is the biggest concern for me, but people only use the save the planet uh, when it's suitable for reaching their interests, just like companies that don't really care about the planet. They only do what makes the biggest profit. So building one simple charger and preferring to use the mentioned batteries, and as I recommend the Duracell Procell, as it's generally good value uh, in my test of 196 AA batteries and also in the recharging test, we can save quite a lot of money and not produce that much of a waste that I have produced in the name of test of 196 AA batteries. These are only, only just the non-rechargeables, excluding the alkalines that were tested for recharging. Then I have uh, two drawers full of nickel metal hydrides and like 50 or 60 of them will be permanently damaged, like destroyed, in the name of cycle test. So, yes, I am quite wasteful, but I am wasteful so you don't have to be. And I am spending my money, it's like over 1500 bucks approximately. Uh, if we, one check corona is like $25, so yeah, it's like. $1,500. So I have spent this amount of money so you don't have to spend like 100 bucks more. Now, uh, do not attempt to recharge Alza batteries, Bateria batteries, half of the Duracells, Energizers, GP Ultra, most of the Panasonic, Tesla and at last Vartas. These must not be recharged as they will instantly leak. Recharging non-rechargeable batteries is quite tricky and has some problems. As the name implies, these are non-rechargeable. And if we attempt to charge them, so there must be some problems, otherwise they wouldn't be non-rechargeable. Uh, the biggest problem is DOD, depth of discharge. Uh, the deeper you discharge them, the more damage they receive. They are made for a single use, so this is not a concern for the manufacturer. So I recommend charging them as soon as possible. Don't let them become drained to the zero. I actually did exactly this in my test uh, because going full cycles is the most precise method to determine the capacity. But going like 40% DOD to 90% SOC uh, would actually be the best for them. Uh, so if possible, don't let them discharge to 0%. It's like 0.8 volts or so, 0.6 maybe for these alkalines. The second biggest problem is time. Time is against us, not only if we hurry to reach the toilet, but also if we leave our discharged battery uh, on a shelf for a longer time. The more discharged they are, and the more damage they suffer, and their suffering gets worse over time. They will eventually leak by themselves, as we have seen in the box. These weren't previously leaked like half a year ago, but they have leaked since then. And there are many more of them lead. They are at the bottom of this box and I can't reach them, but there is more of them lead. So they will leak after time. Third problem is self-discharge. They are just damaged. They are old, they are degraded. So they wouldn't be able to hold the charge for another five years on. 
you can be pretty sure about that <laughs> because they are already degraded. Uh, fourth problem is applied to any alkalines in general. Uh, they like to leak. You may have a battery that didn't leak in my test, but your battery will be from defective batch and it will leak just anyway. I only use rechargeable nickel metal hydrides in my multimeters. Uh, the Hayokis, they use Japanese Eneloops. I also use Japanese Eneloops in this unit rent, which is Chinese actually. They are not only more economic, but also safer for the instrument. If you have an expensive instrument, like for example, this Hayoki DT4282 that costs like 500 bucks. Don't even think about putting alkalines in there. You may regret it. It's like $500 instrument and you want to save like $4 on batteries, but you will lose the instrument instead. It's not worth it. Don't put alkalines in your instruments. Only put them in like uh, flashlight or remote control or uh, dart target and everything like this but not expensive stuff so this is the end of this video uh, the topic of batteries is not yet exhausted uh, so if you feel like you can subscribe to this channel so you will see some of the future tests like test of more than 100 dc to dc converters or test of battery life for the rechargeables or some multimeter reviews like the hayoki it's going on i hope you gained something from this test as I spent a year working on it. And I hope that you will use your now gained knowledge well. That's all for this video. Goodbye and we'll see you in another video.